I changed the title of my uh, lecture <laughs> because I uh, uh, heard some nice uh, well, connections yesterday with the uh, boys and a few other people that presented their uh, thoughts on this issue. So now the subtitle is two words, a media enlightenment, because enlightenment was the issue yesterday. There were, we talked about, uh, of course, with Groysh, we, we talk about uh, Adorno, Lukács, but also with Beck and uh, Giddens, reflexive modernization, we were talking about. Oh, yeah, there's a mic over there. Yeah, right. Talking about media, right. So, <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is to give you just an impression, just an impression of the research that I've been doing for 25 years now. And intermediality was just one, interculturality is another one. And nowadays I'm into uh, what we prefer to call social and urban uh, design. But behind this idea of social and urban design, there's a whole theory on, uh, and a critique on Hegel and the whole dialectical uh, tradition. But I won't bother you with this. So my thing is um, this a very, very brief history of design. So I'll give it just 30 seconds. So we went from syntax to semantics to pragmatics. And we realized that uh, uh, after the digitalization of uh, society and the globalization, we need to go relational. Design is a relational thing, one way or the other. And then we shifted to the social, to the urban. And nowadays, we talk about eco-relational design. So that's where I start. This has been done for me. So. The idea is what is after, what can we imagine after eco-relational design? And these are all are, of course, discursive shifts, different ways of acting and thinking, acting in and thinking about the world. So the 21st century eco-relational design presupposes several things. One of those things is this. So the United Nations formulated the 21st century skills. And the 21st century skills are the way kids uh, uh, learn to handle uh, the specific uh, skills that they need to participate in the 21st century, which is a different century as the 20th and the 19th. My biggest provocation is always, we still live in the 19th century, politics, education, in the 21st century. And something happened in between, we heard, what have happened in between, just in the presentation before this. So what are we going to do in a reflexive modernization with those insights? The most important elements are these. So there is envir environmental awareness and there's digital literacy. We are talking different literacy nowadays. Of course, we're all able to read and write. That's okay, but my students don't read anymore, philosophy students. I have to learn and to read again. To analytical, re, at, analytically read a text, you know, because they have a visual awareness of text. They browse. Okay? We used to look into the index, pick out the name, then read what has been written about the name, and then just show off with what we know about the book. <laughs> right? They browse. It's the same structure. But so, what does this mean that literacy? has to be upgraded with digital literacy and what I call eco-literacy. Where do we get the skills to be eco and medial literate? We are living in a visual culture, no longer cogito ego sum, but video ego sum, right? We are here because we totalize our views and in totalize, totalizing our views, we use images, images and images. So, the whole thing is that we need another literacy for visual culture in which even textures have become visuals. And uh, of course, the, the etymology of texture is that you weave things into each other. So it's about networks. We're talking about networks. The first literacy is quite simple and it already was uh, uh, proposed in the 60s by this guy, Marshall McLuhan. Simple as that. So what does it mean? The medium is the message. It doesn't mean you take a turd and put a nice piece of paper around the turd and then you can sell it to everyone. The medium is a message means something else. And I'm going to show you two, two small films. 
So my issue is, what does a medium do with us? Not how do we use a medium, but what does a medium do with us? Media literacy has to do with both components, active and passive. So this is a film about an escalator. An escalator is a medium, a medium that goes straight up to the future. What happens when we are getting on the escalator without ever having any relation to an escalator. So the first film, I'll show you the introduction of the escalator in a big shopping center in Uzbekistan. There we go. Put on my medium. Right. So, COD? No. Square. Yeah. There we go. There are also smart girls. That's it. Cut the medium. <laughs> so she has a reflexive relation with the medium, right? Now I'll show you another film. <laughs> There's more to come, but that's enough. This gives you an impression. So there we go. So now what happens when the medium has been implemented and we use the medium and it's there. It's just there. We don't even think about it. An iPhone. What happens when you lose your iPhone? If you don't have a secretary. <laughs> so there we go. The second film is about the other. So this, this is the beginning and this is the end, right? That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's nothing else left to do. Sit. Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. So, the uncritical use of media with unexpected effects. What does this mean? I call this specific human condition, I call this radical mediocrity, radicale mitomesigkeit. This is our, it hurts, I know, especially before an audience of geniuses. But we are all radically mediocre. And we are radically mediocre because we are ruled by the media. And the media root us into the world. Root is radix, Greek. So we are rooted in the world by our media. And once the root is cut, we're gone. So my point is, how are we going to uh, turn inside out the radical mediocrity into inter est, inter -est. 
in between us, being related. That's the idea. That's the philosophical idea. So we are rooted in the world. And if you don't believe me, just have a look at this. We are, our world is interfacial. The foundation of the world is interfacial. We see the Higgs boson, we don't see it. We implement a visual on a screen and we conclude this must be there, otherwise we would fragment the moment we just come into existence. There's of course the DNA, the brain, the Milky Way, the supernova, the black hole. Nobody saw the black hole, nobody saw the DNA. We only see screens. We look at screens for eight to nine hours a day. Our connection to the world is interfacial, not face-to-face, -face, interfacial. There's a German scientist who wrote a book on digital uh, um, dementia, right? So there is something happening in our brain. And of course, this is the issue. We can't solve the problem by using the terms that cause the problem. So we have to get out of our discourse and think in a completely different way. So Fuad Luc has given an inventor, inv uh, inventory of the uh, different kinds of design. I don't know whether you know his book, Alistair Fuad Luc, Design Activism. So if design changes the world, what does it mean? Design activism, which is different from making a nice thing for someone. So design activism, of course, urban is what I'm working on now. It's quite interesting, but it's so we are talking with guys who are doing this, like Cole Haas, but also other architects. And on a this is a macro political level. And I work with Dusan Dupel, a very intelligent architect. We also use and reuse materials, and there's this footprint matrix that you use in order to get the materials and then see whether you can recycle or upcycle it, whatever. This is one way of urban design on a macro political level. But the other, on a micro political level, is that we need another kind of literacy, and that's this literacy, eco literacy. This is Fritjof Capra. Right? And Fritjof uh, uh, found the center of eco literacy in California. And they develop all kinds of uh, educational stuff for kids to become eco literate as well. Right? And that's what I implement in my projects in Rotterdam in the bad, bad neighborhoods. And uh, we are trying to do something. I'll show you, I'll give you just an impression. So this is what one of his colleagues says about eco-literacy. I'm not going to read it. You're going to read it yourself. This is an active presentation. Did you do your job, Mr. Interpreter? Okay, you're ready. Right, so this is about what Alice calls eco up there somewhere. And it's a framework, a discourse. So that's what I call mental design. We need mental design, and perhaps your presentation is all about mental design. I don't know, but we'll talk about it later. So what does it mean, mental design? It's about consciousness. And of course, Boris Groys just showed us that uh, he's a good Marxist still, he's a good Marxist. There's a technological part, and there's an ideological part, and the artist, engineer, as a redeemer. Okay, we can talk about this. And of course, Lukács was the first one. He was banned immediately after that. The first one to, to understand that there's something mental and physical that is connected somewhere. I'll come back to this later. So designing discourse that is partly on reflective elements and active elements, right? On, let's call it reflection just for the discourse. So what kind of reflection, how reflective can design become in the 21st century? So this is urban design, that's what I do. 
with those kids. We have an ecosophical, not a philosophical, but ecosophical, uh, Felix Guattari, but also Arna Naas, Gregory Bateson, all those guys that all went in that direction. So I think about footprint and footprint because we all always talk about environmental issues. But the environmental issues start somewhere else. The climate change starts where we start feeding our kids. Feed them, for instance, uh, meat from cows. 80% of the emissions is caused by cows. Farting cows. That's your hamburger. But okay, apart from that, what we try to do is get those kids into an eco-circle, an eco-sophical circle, by having them to do sport, judo, very important, a relational sport. You can't judo on your own. So then care, then gardening, then cooking, then food. You can't, we don't accept the answer, I don't know. You can't accept the answer, I don't know, because we are in a reflexive modernization. So when they eat something, where does it come from? Where do the products come from? How do they grow the products? Everywhere, people are working, their hands are making something that is handed over to you and you take it as evident. You don't think about the preconditions. So you have to learn them what the preconditions are in a reflective with an A way. Do it yourself. Design yourself. So this potato couch kit, which is a passive consumer, is turned into a productive, act active producer. So we learn the kids to make films. And once you make a film, you know that looking at a film or looking at an ad ad advertisement, you know there has been cuts over there. Someone chose to show you this. This is not reality. This is someone who chose these kind of images and made a composition of those images to show you something else. It's very important. So you become an active producer in looking at something. Yesterday there was a critique on the idea that everyone is a designer and I agree with that critique, no problem. Of course there are professional designers and there are of course people, as you showed us, nowadays that have to design their lives. So you have to choose. But the paradoxical situation is that we can't choose any longer because there's so much to choose. I prefer to go to a restaurant that only has one menu. So you go to the Greek or to the pizzeria, and you've got a list of pizzeria, you know, it's all the same. So what does it mean that Dasein has become design? Forward look again. So if we think about design activism, it's about imagination, about practice, and a counter-narrative. Where do we get the counter-narrative? Out of the box, the different discourse. So that's where my research comes in. It's a in-between of politics, arts, and philosophy. Right? So the interests, in the most literal sense, in the Heideggerian sense, or the, even better, the Hannah Arendtian uh, sense, or perhaps the Richard Sennett sense, doesn't matter which sense, or perhaps Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, Irigaré, Christeva sense, Jean-Luc Nancy sense, I don't care as long as it makes sense. <laughs> right? So, academical discourses, great. So, it's about affects, percepts, and concepts. Uh, Deleuze, Guattari, qu'est-ce que c'est la, uh, qu -ce que, qu -ce que la philosophie? What is philosophy? But also uh, Donald Norman, right? Emotional design. On three levels, visceral, behavioral, reflective, brain, limbic system, neocortex. When you take this, this is the experience of a design product. When you translate this to a different level, thinking differently, redesigning our imagination, the turning of a discourse, we have to redesign our imagination. And now I'm going to the deepest level of our mental design. We have to redesign our disposition, our imaginative disposition. Right. What exactly structures our mental landscape? Is this sun rising or is it 
setting. What do you think? Neither rising, neither setting. There is no rising sun, there is no setting sun. There is romantics, there's love, there's flowers, there's a good fuck, but the sun does not rise, the sun does not set. It's a metaphor, but it's more than a metaphor. It structures our brain and it gives, it makes a composite of all the different experiences that we have. So, imagining society always uses this, the pyramid. Maslow, the dollar, the power structure. Well, Foucault, of course, deconstructed it, but okay, we come back to that later. P pyramids, we always think in pyramids. So, climbing the social ladder, why? Why Mitterrand, why? Okay, that's what happened. So we build those uh, 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 premises for dead pharaohs, dead pharaohs. There's no time, it's eternity. Then we toppled it in the Renaissance and we suddenly got perspective, great. There's an end, there's an horizon, there's a point on the horizon. And so we had the future. Time was invented by toppling eternity, okay? So what's behind the horizon? Fuck, what's behind the horizon? So lift up the horizon, it's completely the same, even worse. So utopism, come back to that later. I think there's something to be said that utopism has some negative effects. But it has to do with time space. Time space changed completely because of this. So when they shut Gagarin or this dog into space, but when human being went into space, then he saw a globe, not a horizon. The horizon vanished. And he understood that it's all around. When you walk towards the horizon and keep on walking, you end up Hegelian dialectics with yourself. Okay? So, because of feedback loops, we now understand that there's no horizon. There's an actuality. There's, of course, a suspension of actuality, which we call, call virtuality. But there's not something like time, space, and the end of uh, time, space, horizon, or utopia. The time has changed and the space has changed. So nowadays, we think about this, networks. Not a pyramid, but a network. And everyone in the audience will say, yes, of course, Osling, we know that. We already know that. We don't need you to tell us this. But the implication of this imagination is so radically different from the pyramid. We still imply our behavior in pyramidical sense while living in a network society. So we have to raise our kids in network society terms, not in pyramidical terms. So it's not, it's, so the medium and the message are one. It's what Latour calls an actant. Not an actor, an actant. Things and human beings are connected internally. Strip yourself of all your media. Be naked and ask yourself or ask your neighbor, who am I? We're all mediatized completely. Our clothes, fashion, everything. Pacemaker, transport media, communication media, dope, cocaine. So, if we strip ourselves from media, we are nothing. We are always media and men. The other name for this is culture. So this is where we're heading at. A nodal, centrifugal kind of society instead of a center and centripetal. So we are a node in a distributed network, like the brains. They are working on finding the connectome, as they call it, in America big billion uh, costing project to find the connectome. Another five minutes? Okay, we'll speed up. You understand this? Okay. You understand this? Okay. You understand this? Okay. This is what we're adding at, right? Now imagine our, our human condition. Come on, you can do it, right? This is what happens. This is being interested. 
right? They are phoning to each other, probably. There's no time space. It's different. So, is it this? <laughs> no, it's not this. Okay, it's this. Self-reflection. We are the nod and the note. And there's nothing in ourselves. Nothing. We just nod it. And then in the self-reflexive loop, something happens and gets substantial. That's what we call ego self-subjectivity. Right. Is it fast enough? Okay, there we go. Now we have to loop our productivity. Not linear, but circular. That's not, not a problem because we always did that. It's called self-reflectivity. But we always thought that self-reflectivity connects to ourself. But self-reflectivity is a relational thing. You talk to yourself all day. It's a relational thing. So this is what we are. Not an individual, but an individual. Right? We are individuals. So when we intervene in our urban projects, I let kids do some, uh, 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 things like judo, gardening, or philosophy, whatever, or technical things, or computers. We introduce them into a network and we learn them the skills. And I don't ask them, how do you feel? I'm not interested in an individual. I'm interested in individuals, in skills. You care about yourself. When I care about your network, you can care about yourself. So we have to make a 4D kind of composition of the human being, not a 3D. Which means that uh, Escher was right. You go inside and you end up outside. You go upstairs and you end up downstairs. So a, a very quick into Japan. Look, folding, right? Folding. Yes, folding. Empty is form, form is emptiness, yeah, performance, that's what you said, performance, right? So it's all imminence, right? Like gardens, ma, they call it. The, the Japanese word for, for person is ningen. When you translate it into English, it means in between person. There's no individual. So feedback, footprint, and self-reflection, that's what I'm talking about in the individual is an individual. So what does it mean for eco-relational design? Back to Norman, well, we have to go this way. Let's try it on the level of the consciousness. A circular economy needs a circular, an ecological life. What does it mean to have an ecological life? Does it mean that you uh, uh, transport yourself in a way or eat in a certain way? No, it means that you have to upscale yourself all the time. So it's not inventing yourself, it's constructing yourself on different scales all the time. So when you're 65, you're still young because you have upscaled yourself. But that's a different thing. So threefold sustainability, physical, social, and mental. So not only the left part, also the other parts. When we talk about sustainability, and this is where it all ends up. This is the discourse that I use talking about my educational projects. It's not what's in people, it is what is between people. Creativity is not something in people, but between people, or between man and his medium. That's where it happens, not inside. There's nothing inside. I won't get too Zen Buddhistic on this, but nothing. <laughs> to conclude, we need an enlightenment of the media, medial enlightenment. This has been enlightened. Okay, Kant, whatever, from Spinoza to Kant. This is what we didn't understand. We enlightened our body by getting away resistance and making life more comfortable, which is very interesting. But we didn't realize that it had effects and implications that changed our consciousness. And we had an enlightenment of sight. I can Skype with my, not with my grandmother, but with my, no, not with my grandkids, with my daughter in Brazil. Skyping, so no resistance, no time space. But it had effects as well, the way we use our media. So this is what we need, a medial enlightenment. Mental, social, and physical. Which means that from the beginning on, kids should learn what it means to resist a medium and to work with a medium. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>